folks. How is everybody this evening? Um, let's see. If I can get that. No, that's not going to angle down anymore. That's better. Um, so I was thinking that we might be out on the porch this evening, but there's some kind of activity downtown here. There was an ambulance and a fire truck. Looked like there was a potential for some sirens. So I brought it inside again, and um, eh, that's okay. Um, we will be joined a little bit later on by a special animal guest. Um, I'll just do without the, the crickets in the background for this week. Um, hope you're all having a great week. Um, got lots of uh, good nature to share with you. And um, why don't we go ahead and get started? Oop. Yep. Let's try that again. Let's go ahead and get started. So, um, in last week's column, we take, uh, took a look at uh, what's going on with our local insect community in the form of bees or not bees. Um, there's actually two parts to that column. Uh, the gist of it was that bees get blamed for a lot of things at this time of year. Um, how many times in the last few weeks haven't you heard someone say, oh, I got stung by a bee? Well, chances are it was a wasp. We'll take a look at that in a few slides, but I, I wanted to start off with these two really interesting looking creatures. Quick glance, um, you're probably tempted to think that they are indeed bees. Um, but if we look a little bit closer, uh, this one here on the left, uh, it's got very large eyes and it's got two really puny antennae. Um, this fellow over here, or ma'am, I'm not sure which, <laughs> over here on the right, um, Again, very large eyes, forward-facing eyes, uh, much like you would see in something that was predatory. Um, and then it's got these, these um, claws here meant for, for grasping not so much flowers as prey. What we're looking at here is uh, a couple of different species of robber fly. Um, the picture on the right, I took that this summer. I think it was uh, early July at uh, Delnor Woods, that little creature landed on me. Uh, it didn't fly at all like a bee. Um, it was very direct in its motion and it didn't seem to have any interest in any of the flowers that were nearby. I I'm not sure of the species, I just knew that it was a, a type of robber fly. This one on the left, um, I was able to at least get it to genus. Um, and I just took this picture, um, Oh gosh, maybe three weeks ago or so out at the Hickory Knolls natural area. It was uh, clinging to a broken off blade of grass. There were um, bees and wasps in the area, but uh, this one it didn't seem to really have any interest in uh, feeding on flowers like some of the bees were, nor was it uh, interested in the fallen fruit that was nearby, which is what was attracting the wasps. Uh, so what we're looking at here is two really, really uh, good uh, examples of mimicry. Uh, flies that look like bees. Now, um, if we do a side-by-side -side comparison of that one on the left, that's, uh, like I said, I wasn't able to be for sure about the species, but I'm pretty sure Lafria is the genus. And um, uh, when we put it next to a bumblebee, uh, the eastern bumblebee is our most common species in this area, uh, the differences become a little bit more apparent. Look at this long antennae here that's coming off the front of the uh, eastern bumblebee. Um, and then again, the short antenna here on our fly on uh, the left. So uh, robber flies, uh, 
they are predators. They prey on other insects. Different types of robber flies specialize in um, different types of insects. Uh, I first found out about these guys, oh gosh, it was back in um, 2007. It was uh, when I worked at Red Oak Nature Center. It was also the um, uh, that was the last periodical cicada emergence of, in this area. That was when Brood 13 last came out. Um, and I, I was looking around Red Oak. You know, the, the forecast for the area was, oh, we were going to be inundated with these cicadas. And I was, I was really excited about it. And then I was completely underwhelmed because uh, in a lot of uh, eastern King County, the populations have really... Uh, plummeted over the uh, the decades. So uh, around Red Oak, I heard eh, three or four maybe male periodical cicadas calling, and um, I was so excited to see one um, laying on the driveway. Well, I wasn't so ex I was I was actually kind of sad because I thought, oh gosh, here's one that's dead, and we don't have that many to start with. Well, then I looked more closely at it, and stuck to the side of it was what I thought was a bumblebee. In fact, it might even have been the same species because it was a, a small, uh, dark-looking uh, uh, bumblebee-looking creature. Um, and the, the flight times for that species and that periodical cicada seem to, to line up pretty well. Anyway, that's when I first learned about robber flies, that they, they uh, look like lots of different things, in, including bumblebees. There's other types of robber flies. Some look almost like a, a dragonfly, um, but again, with the, the large eyes and the short antennae. Um, but these guys uh, um, are all of um, they're always they, they are such good mimics of bumblebees that it's it's really hard until you look closely you're just going to assume that it's a bee so the next time you see a bee you may look again and find out that it's not a bee or two bees so um, as it turns out we have lots of um, in, uh, flies that uh, fly around mimicking bees this one I put in it it looks you know, kind of superficially you might think bee but um, and it's actually called the bee fly but it gets its name uh, not so much from the way it looks but from what it does this parasitizes uh, some of our uh, native bees the uh, the female bee fly will lay her eggs uh, in the nests of our the ground nests of some of our native bees and then uh, her offspring will uh, prey on those larvae of the native bees so uh, bee flies um, make their living off of our local native bees um, this one here, sometimes you hear them called hoverfly, sometimes you call them uh, flower flies, uh, surfid flies refers to the family, and there's there's several different kinds. Um, a lot of times the difference is in the markings here on the abdomen, but boy, again, quick glance, you see the black, you see the yellow, and your brain just registers B. Now, uh, this... Uh, particular surfid landed on me. Um, uh, we were having a creek day with our nature camp kids a couple of years ago. So this was over at Leroy Oaks along Fearson Creek. And it was um, just kind of hanging out on my, uh, my hand there. This is not a predatory um, bee mimic. This actually uh, flower fly, it goes to flowers. It uh, collects uh, nectar there. I put this picture in not just because it looks like a bee, but also it shows off one of the best uh, known characteristics of uh, really any fly. Flies are in the order Diptera, which means two wings. It's one of the only insect orders that only has two wings. Most of our insects are, are beetles, our butterflies and moths, our uh, damselflies and dragonflies, they'll have two pairs of wings. Flies only have one pair, but look behind the wings on this fly. You see those two light colored objects, one on either side sticking out. They look almost like little um, uh, batons. Those are called halters, and they are the uh, kind of the, the balancing mechanism that flies use 
that that makes up for that lack of a hind wing. It's uh, the hallmark of, of many, many of our local flies, even our house flies. If you look really closely, you can find the halters on them. If you see uh, crane flies, you know, those large flies that are sometimes called giant mosquitoes, they have really prominent halters as well. Um, so uh, when you think you're looking at a bee, uh, look again because you might not be looking at a bee at all. It might actually be a fly. So um, the other part of the column, uh, I talked about the, the stings that occur at this time of year. And yes, bees can sting. But um, this time of year, when, and by this time I'm talking about you know, Labor Day forward until we get a hard frost, uh, when, when people get stung, it's more often uh, the result of an encounter with these guys here, the yellow jackets. Uh, this, I took this video over at the native plant garden um, behind Potawatomi. This uh, little very uh, well hidden hole here, I suspect this might have uh, connected up to an old chipmunk burrow. Look at the, uh, the traffic in and out of this hole. This is what you want to watch out for. If, if you're out and you're walking around and you might uh, be you know, somewhat aware of some activity down low to the ground, um, insects flying around. It's usually one of two things. Uh, if, if you are walking in a park where someone hasn't picked up after their dog, you might see a lot of insect activity like that around um, something that a dog has left behind, some dog waste on the path. There'll be a lot of flies. But um, if it's in the, uh, in the grass or in the leaves that you're walking and you see that insect activity, walk very carefully because it's probably an underground yellow jacket nest. So this is the uh, the other creature that gets blamed uh, a lot. F um, or that, uh, bees end up taking the blame for a lot of the time. Uh, last year uh, I was walking, uh, where was I walking? I was over on uh, 8th Street and there happened to be a yellow jacket nest on the parkway uh, on 8th a little bit south of Prairie and uh, someone had taken some sidewalk chalk and wrote bees with an arrow, I guess, to warn the neighbors, you know, look out, you might get stung by a quote unquote bee. Well, I got a hold of some sidewalk chalk and I went back the next day and I scratched out bees and I put wasps just to kind of drive home the point. <laughs> if you're getting stung in the fall, it's probably not a bee, it's probably a wasp. So um, with that, <laughs> Let's take a little trip. Actually, let's not take a little trip, but let's meet uh, someone who's uh, perhaps taken a trip up north here uh, from the Gulf Coast. Meet the Gulf Coast tick. Um, this is a new um, species on our tick radar here in northern Illinois. Um, it looks at first glance kind of like our uh, local dog ticks. Here's the, the male of the species. Um, th these ticks are they're about the same size. Uh, picture a, a small, you know, the, uh, the edible watermelon seeds. Um, they, they've, they've gotten smaller over the years, watermelon seeds have. And um, uh, if you picture something that's um, about the size of a, of a small watermelon seed, that's the size of these ticks. Um, here they are side by side with our local um, dog ticks. Dog ticks also go by the name of uh, wood tick. So dog tick, wood tick, same species. But um, the markings at first glance look kind of similar. Uh, if you know me and you know how I talk about ticks, you know that I refer to the dog tick female, which is over here on the left. I refer to her as wearing a necklace. Uh, and on the right, we've got our male dog tick. It looks like he's wearing suspenders. So it's a pretty easy way to tell the difference between the male and the female uh, dog tick or wood tick. Um, with ticks, it's not as important to, to know the males from the females because they both need a blood meal. Um, with, with mosquitoes, it's only the females that need a blood meal. Uh, they need that in order to uh, lay their eggs. 
Uh, male mosquitoes tend to sip flower nectar. Uh, they're, they're not uh, going to bite humans. They don't need the blood. Uh, ticks, whether they're males or females, and regardless of species, they need blood meals in order to uh, kind of advance to their next stage. It's sort of like you know, in video games where you need to get the, you know, the sword or the magic jewel or whatever so you go to the next level. Uh, same with ticks, they need that blood so that they can grow and progress onto their next life stage. Um, what's really obvious to me in comparing these guys side by side is the mouth parts. Um, Look at the size of the mouth parts on these Gulf Coast ticks as compared to the shorter and um, somewhat more rounded mouth parts on our dog ticks. Uh, that's probably the, the, the thing that would, would jump out the most at these, uh, comparing these species. Um, you might be thinking, well, why are we talking about Gulf Coast ticks here in northern Illinois? Well, as it turns out, uh, these ticks, they're, they're proving to be kind of mobile. They can, they actually, they move at least 12 feet per minute, which is pretty fast uh, for a tick. Uh, normally, ticks, um, they hang out at the top of uh, vegetation, uh, you know, the tips of uh, sh shrub branches or on the tops of uh, blades of grass and they just sort of they they wave their little forearms around and then when uh, something moves by uh, they just assume that it's going to have blood inside of it most things around here that move um, have some sort of blood it might be a mammal uh, it might be a bird but they will grab onto it and they will uh, climb up and they will uh, then latch on to an area of rich blood source and in humans it tends to be up on the upper part of the body, but again, if, if they're really hungry, they might just grab on, you know, wherever they can. But uh, these these uh, Gulf Coast ticks appear to be uh, moving northward, maybe not so much on their own power, but uh, we are moving them around as we visit areas of the south and then we come north, we might be transporting these uh, creatures north with us. Um, this is a map from the Illinois Department of Public Health, and these are counties that have uh, confirmed uh, occurrences of the Gulf Coast tick. And you see, Kane County is still white, but blue um, blue indicates um, incident of um, they've been um, surveyed there, and um, in uh, DuPage County they were found in Wayne, which those of us who live around here know that Wayne is pretty darn close to uh, to Kane County. So uh, they are in the area. What uh, Dr. Holly Tootin, she's our state uh, vector ecologist. Uh, she works out of Champaign, but she travels all around the state. She and her crew are constantly surveying for ticks uh, and mosquitoes as too to keep on top uh, and try maybe to get ahead a little bit of the uh, incidence of uh, tick and mosquito-borne illness here in our state. Um, she says that only adult Gulf Coast ticks have been found so far, which indicates that um, they're not, um, hopefully indicates that they're not breeding here yet, but they are showing up. I think it's, uh, I think it's up to 17 counties that they've been observed in here in Illinois. So just kind of something to, uh, to keep an eye out for. I, I just want to review a little bit some things you can do to uh, protect yourself. Uh, Dr. Tootin has a great phrase. She says, don't be scared, be prepared. So uh, when you head out, and we are coming into, there's going to be one more little burst of tick activity uh, before we head into our uh, cold weather months where these uh, creatures go dormant. But if you go out, uh, you're planning on being out in uh, tick country, which is really any place where it's not regularly mowed, where there's tall grasses, dense shrubbery, that's where they like to hang out. Uh, wear light colored clothing. That's going to help you um, be able to see these guys if they should happen to crawl on you. Uh, it might also help if it is a warm day, and we are still having some warm days, aren't we? Here in October, it's, I think it's going to be 80 again this weekend. Light colored clothing will help keep you a little bit cooler. It'll uh, reflect the heat of the sun just a little bit. Um, ticks use our uh, carbon dioxide emissions as well as our uh, body heat to uh, locate something to latch onto. So wearing that light clothing is going to help you uh, spot 
uh, any hitchhikers you might have picked up. Now, when, when Holly Tootin goes out, she wears a full-blown, uh, looks like a hazmat suit. It's all white, and um, she's, she's got some other enhancements here, too. Uh, she actually treats those suits. Um, you can buy treated clothing, uh, or we've talked about this before. You can uh, buy uh, permethrin-containing uh, repellents that you can spray on your clothing. This stuff, uh, this is what our risk management agency is recommending that we do here at the Park District to help prevent the, the incident of tick bites. But um, permethrin, it doesn't out and out kill them, but it's a very powerful repellent because it makes the ticks uncomfortable. Uh, you can spray this on your clothing or your gear, uh, your shoes, whatever footwear you've got on. And um, it's good for, I think it's six weeks or six washings, whichever uh, comes first. Uh, it makes the ticks uncomfortable and it, it makes them drop off. Uh, once they fall off, uh, they uh, uh, are more vulnerable, uh, exposed. They may, may die of exposure once they fall off of you. So this is, this is um, probably the best uh, um, thing you can do to protect yourself uh, from ticks when you're out and about. Um, combine that with tucking your pant legs into your socks. Um, over here on the right, you see what looks kind of like um, oh, it looks kind of like wallpaper. What that is is a, a strip of double-sided carpet tape, the really sticky white tape that you use to stick carpet down to the ground, uh, to your floor. Um, Dr. Tootin and her team will take that and wrap that around their boots. So uh, anything that tries to crawl up will uh, get stuck on that tape. So these are uh, a couple of measures that will help. Uh, staying in the center of the trail, too, is because is, um, the trails in this area, the forest preserves or park districts, they are mowed uh, fairly regularly to um, make it more walkable and also uh, keep the, uh, the ticks at bay. So this was a photo from our... Uh, this is our King County Certified Naturalist class this summer. We were out at uh, Dick Young Forest Preserve, and um, I stepped off the trail. I think this was where we were going to be talking about a, a, a bee tree that's alongside the prairie out there. Anyway, um, guess who stepped into tick country? <laughs> that would be me. Um, I, uh, I went home with a few little hitchhikers that day. Uh, so staying on the trail uh, is another, uh, staying um, even towards the center of the trail uh, is a good measure that you can take to help uh, prevent uh, taking home some, some unwanted uh, uh, little eight-legged friends. Now, um, Dr. Tootin also told me um, when we talked a couple of years ago, she said, anytime you go out, even if you've you know, treated your clothing and you've got your socks uh, your pants tucked into your socks, and you've, you've done all these precautions. It um, is always a good idea, too, to take a shower, uh, generally within three hours of uh, being out in um, tick land. Uh, scrub everywhere, and uh, that will help, you know, you, you will help rinse off, scrub off anything that you might not have been able to keep out by other means. <laughs> Now, should the unthinkable happen <laughs> and uh, a tick does attach itself, um, don't light a match uh, and try to scare it out that way. Don't smother it with Vaseline or nail polish. Those things just irritate the tick. And you don't want a tick that's um, agitated, uh, especially when it's plugged into your skin like that. These guys... Um, they they are you know they're, they're they're punctured into your skin and once they're they're set like that uh, fluids can exchange from their body into your body and they are especially prone to doing that when they're uh, uh, agitated or irritated upset and um, if they regurgitate those fluids into you, that's when the uh, the chance of disease transmission really goes up so um, doing uh, Taking a, a pair of tweezers or uh, there's some different gadgets you can buy too. There's one called a tick key that is very effective. Uh, you want to use a, a, a steady uh, pressure uh, as you pull 
the uh, tick, you, you want to hold as close to your skin as possible because you don't want to leave the head behind. So keeping that, that pressure on the tick as you pull backward, that's going to um, cause all the, its mouth parts have all, all these rows of hooks and then they also cement themselves with a very uh, sticky glue-like material. So keeping that pressure on is uh, eventually the tick, you are stronger than the tick and uh, you will be able to back the tick out. Um, you want to uh, clean the area thoroughly. Uh, might not hurt to uh, report the tick bite to your doctor and uh, follow whatever precautions they would recommend. Generally speaking, and, and I am not a doctor, but um, the the, the quicker you find the tick uh, before it starts to engorge, the uh, the less chance you have of catching anything that that tick might be harboring. You know, with that, um, let's go on. Let's talk about some some pretty cool things that are happening out in the woods. You know, last week we talked about red baneberry, and we read that that awesome experiment by Alice Bacon in 1903, where she ate the red berries of red baneberry. Um, I didn't want to leave you with the impression that those are the only red berries that you might run into in the woods at this time of year. Um, Jack in the pulpit, uh, the plant you know, that's got the uh, the um, spathe and spadix, the the little hood, the jack in the pulpit um, flower in the springtime. Well, the female uh, jacks, which I guess are Janes, uh, they have uh, formed their fruits and they look like giant red raspberries. These, um, I took this picture a couple of weeks ago. These are starting to get knocked down and, and are, um, are kind of falling off on the ground now. Um, uh, they're they're not edible by humans. There are some birds. I've heard wild turkeys like to eat uh, these berries, um, but this is uh, something else red you might see in our woods. Uh, you might also see uh, the red berries of false Solomon seal. Um, now, Solomon seal, uh, that's the plant that has these uh, very similar appearing sorts of leaves as you see here in these photos, but uh, the true or regular Solomon seal has a dark blue berry that hangs underneath uh, in, in pairs going up the stem of the plant. False Solomon seal, uh, its flowers are at the end of the stem and that's where the fruit forms. So um, I took these pictures over at um, the native plant garden at Potawatomi where uh, I also saw this. Now uh, roses don't typically grow in in woodlands, but they might grow along the edges and you certainly will see them in sunnier areas uh, in old fields and in prairies. This is the uh, the Illinois rose and those flowers have now uh, formed their fruit. Some people call these rose hips. This is a great source of uh, vitamin C. If you've ever had rose hip tea, it was probably made uh, from a type might not have been Illinois rose, but it was certainly from uh, some sort of rose berry like this. Uh, these, I have heard of people harvesting these and um, uh, steeping them, making their own teas uh, from the dried out berries. But this is a, another nice benefit uh, for wildlife. Uh, planting things like this in your yard will definitely up the, uh, the food quality um, as we head into winter, the food availability for um, some of our birds and other wildlife looking for uh, seeds and things to, to munch on as the temperatures get colder. Now um, this next item, it's it's actually not a great white shark. Uh, it might be a great white mink. I got this email the other day. Uh, a woman uh, from uh, the area writes, as I was sitting on my deck one recent afternoon, I saw something white moving out of the corner of my eye. At first I thought it was an opossum, but it had a fluffy tail. So picture, you know, the humped back of an opossum. Uh, they kind of have that uh, arch look sometimes as they're um, uh, ambling around. Uh, she said she thinks it was a white mink. Uh, we live on the fox and I've occasionally seen brown mink. Um, I took a picture, but all that came out was a white blob. Have white mink been spotted in the area? Well, for this, I'm going to turn it over to you. I haven't heard of any white mink myself. Um, my, actually, my first thought was, well, maybe she saw uh, a weasel. 
um, but it's we're a little bit ahead of time. We are, our our long-tailed weasels and our least weasels in this area they do change their fur from brown in the summer to white in the winter. The tip of the tail always stays black though, and we're just a little bit early for that. That'll be happening very soon. Um, weasels too are they're a little bit smaller than our mink. Our mink are pretty husky animals. Um, and the, the tail, uh, neither one of them has a really fluffy tail, but of the two, comparing the weasel to the mink, the, the mink would have the, the fluffier of the two tails. Um, she, I asked her if she could send the picture, and she said, oh, you know, I deleted it. But then she went online and found out how you can undelete things, so she actually got it back, and this is what she sent me. On the uh, left here, we have um, the image, and then here I, I tried to blow up the animal in the, uh, in the picture here. So it's, it's moving away from us. This um, area down at the bottom of the white blob, that's the fluffy tail. And um, the way it's hunched over, I mean, it, gosh, it sure does look mink-like. Uh, I asked her if it if it bounded or if it had a, a, a steep arch to its back, and she said, you know, it was it just it happened so quickly, and and she was you know hurrying to get a picture of it, so she couldn't really take it all in, and she uh, said that she, it'd been a while since she'd seen a mink move. I asked her if it moved like a mink, you know how they kind of. Um, have that sort of undulating uh, movement that they use, especially if they're trying to scurry away from an area. But it it's it's an interesting creature. It's 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 not an opossum, and it's not a cat. Um, it might be a white mink. If more develops on this story, I will let you know. And please, if you happen to see or hear about a white mink, if you could let me know, that'd be awesome. Love to track this down. We have had, um, you know, there was the white um, squirrels that have been popping up around here from time to time. There was the albino squirrel out on Crane Road, which uh, last spring was still around. I haven't heard about it much over the summer, but it's been around for at least two years. Uh, there was the uh, the squirrel over at Potawatomi too that had the white, uh, was it the white tail or was it all white? Can't right, quite remember, but uh, albinism, the complete lack of color, including the pink eyes, um, or uh, leucism, which is a partial loss of pigment. So the eyes might still be dark, or there might be other areas of darkness on the body. It occurs in lots of different animals in their area. Um, if I find out that it's happened with the mink and we can get a, a confirmation or another photo of it, I will definitely let you know about that. But it's kind of cool when these things happen. Um, if, if if this is a mink, uh, it looks like it's uh, full grown. And if it can make it to winter time, it's going to have a great advantage. Uh, if we get a snowy winter, it might do just fine uh, for the next few months. But anyway, more to be seen on that story. <laughs> Um, it's also uh, crunch time. So if you, if you look, I, I came across this. I was walking home from work the other night, and uh, I almost stepped on this. This was over um, on Horn Street. Uh, I have seen so many close calls with squirrels and chipmunks on our streets and on our bike trails. Uh, it is definitely crunch time for these rodents as we are moving from fall, uh, progressing through fall, getting ready for winter. These guys are, are literally going nuts collecting things for winter. Now, our chipmunks, um, they are what we call larder hoarders. So they are uh, collecting nuts and taking them down into their burrows where they will stay for the winter. Chipmunks don't do what we call true hibernation. They'll spend times in periods of what we call torpor, where they're you know they're they're kind of groggy, but they they might rouse from time to time and, and get a bite to eat. Um, so they want to make sure they've got nuts and seeds stored uh, below the ground. Our squirrels are scatter hoarders, so they are collecting uh, nuts and burying them all over the place, so that they can then um, mostly through recall. Uh, it, their brains are really phenomenal at remembering where they have uh, buried uh, the acorns and the walnuts and the, the different things that they find. Um, but this this um, 
they're, they're just in, in, a, in a bit of a frenzy right now. They're not making good decisions, especially the, the younger ones. This might be their uh, first fall. And um, boy, they're running out in front of cars. I saw one in front of me yesterday. I, I couldn't believe it emerged on the other side. It went right underneath the car, somehow managed to avoid the wheels and uh, ran up a tree across the road. But um, <laughs> keep an eye out for these guys. Um, this was also uh, on that same walk. This was uh, underneath a black walnut tree. The um, owners of this house had actually filled an old uh, recycling bin with the nuts, and there were still this many more walnuts down on the ground. I've got personal experience with this too at my mom's house. I'm there every weekend, and I've been trying to stay on top of the walnuts that are falling from her tree as well. It is just a huge year for these tree nuts. Um, which um, I think maybe adds to the excitement for the squirrels. There's just so much richness. Um, they want to take as much advantage of it as possible. Uh, I um, was looking at this and I thought, you know, maybe this is the year uh, I gather walnuts and then spend the winter cracking them open. Um, I, I actually picked up a small bag full of um, uh, if you see me in some week and my hands are all brown, that means that I actually made good on that promise or threat and I forgot to wear gloves. They're not called black walnuts for, for no reason. <laughs> so, um, you know, just remember, beware, um, chipmunks and squirrels, they're not making good decisions right now. They, they might shoot out in front of your car. They might shoot out in front of your bike. Uh, try to be careful, but um, put your safety uh, first. All right, so so with these walnuts, so so this was at uh, my mom's the other night. Um, I was collecting a few there, and uh, the husks are we're getting past the point where they're they're hard and green. The the husks are starting to um, kind of age. They're they're getting mushy. I started to wipe the husk off of this nut, and look at what I found underneath. Um. A whole bunch of little larvae. Um, I uh, have, you know, I grew up in the house where my mom still lives. I've picked up walnuts, you know, pretty much every fall um, for the last 50 years or so. And um, I never really um, you know, noticed these guys before. Uh, these are uh, walnut husk maggots. Uh, they're the um, offspring of the walnut husk fly. And um, it's kind of an interesting little life cycle they have. These guys uh, feed on the husk, uh, in that inner layer of the husk. It can actually affect the quality of the nut meat inside. So I'll, I'll see of the ones I picked up if I accidentally brought home any of these and if there's any difference in the, the, uh, the nut meat that's inside. But um, they are going to overwinter in the ground and then they'll emerge next year and start the cycle over again. But um, just kind of took me aback a little bit. And I'm wondering, I, I didn't have a, a chance to do a real deep dive on these guys, but I'm kind of wondering when there's this much richness here, I mean, this looks like um, this would be some pretty easy food for something to eat. Now, uh, walnuts, uh, they do produce that juglone. It's a, a chemical that can uh, retard the growth of certain other types of plants. I don't know if these uh, fly larvae or maggots, if they, um, have any of that in their system if they might not be good for things to eat if they have a built-in protection that way i didn't see anything uh, feeding on them i kind of peeked out the window a couple times at some walnuts that i'd opened up and really everything was leaving them alone but it's a very very short period of observation but something something uh, interesting to think about and and to maybe observe uh, if you've got walnuts of your own so uh with that um, let's just, you know, we've done ticks, we've done maggots, let's go all the way and let's talk about spiders too. Um, it's a spiderific time of year. Uh, the picture on the left was uh, 
sent to me by a coworker here in the marketing department. Uh, she is really not fond of these sorts of creatures, but uh, she was out. She's a, a den mother for her son's Cub Scout troop, and they were camping this weekend. And what did they find? But this beautiful spider. Um, this actually happens to be um, a spider we call the pumpkin spider. It ha can have quite a bit of variation in the markings. If we go back here, we see this one is bright yellow. This one's more of a, a pumpkiny orange color. But you notice uh, with all that pattern on the back, there's no white. And when we look at the spider over here on the right, um, again, highly patterned um, stripes on the legs, but there's white in the pattern. Uh, this was found by Ryan, one of our uh, restoration ecologists. Uh, he sent the picture in a couple of days ago. I said, what the heck is this? That is a shamrock spider. Um, now, it, uh, both of these spiders, you can see the, these females, they have a, a really uh, large abdomen. They're getting ready to, to lay their eggs, deposit their egg sacs as we get into fall. Um, Shamrock spiders, they can be this uh, sort of brick red color. They can be orangish in color, much like the pumpkin spider. Uh, they can also be kind of a greenish color, uh, like we see in this male. Um, and remember how we, how we know that a, a spider is a male? We look for the little boxing gloves up there by the head. Those are his uh, reproductive organs. Uh, he carries them up there at the, the front. Um, but this is another color that we might see the shamrock spider. Even the females can uh, be in this sort of greenish color, but there is white in the pattern um, with these uh, highly patterned legs as well. So um, keep an eye out for these two as well as this one. Uh, Jerry, you sent this one in. This is uh, a um, uh, cross orb weaver. Um, this one is... Um, one that we see really frequently here uh, along the Fox River too. I would say most of the orb webs that we see uh, on the bridge, uh, bridges over the Fox River uh, and the uh, storefronts that have lights, uh, these spiders are all living like kings and queens, uh, feeding on the caddisflies and mayflies and other things that come up out of the river. But uh, they do well wherever they are. Jerry, I, I forgot to ask you if yours was situated at all by uh, um, an outside light, but they these spiders do really well at spinning webs um, near where they know that there's going to be a lot of insects flying around. Now, um, Jerry also sent in a picture of the underside of the spider. And um, if we look uh, towards the tip of the abdomen, um, there's spinnerets there. That's the uh, silk making uh, structures on the spider. Uh, th these guys have uh, six different, think of them as like little shower heads or little jets that uh, spin proteins into web um, uh, or silk. And the different little shower heads, they make different kinds of silk that use, are used for different purposes. In, a, in an orb web, which we can kind of see here um, in uh, Jerry's photo, um, there are the rays that extend out. That's, that's the structural component of the web. Uh, those are the, the, the stronger pieces of silk that help the web maintain that that round orb shape. Uh, then we've got the um, the uh, circular parts that, that fill in in between those rays. Uh, those are the sticky parts. That's what will actually cause the, uh, the prey to get trapped in the web. Um, that's two different kinds of silks. Uh, there's another one. Um, let's go to this one here. Um, Probably the most important uh, silk that the spider, the females, can create is uh, the silk that's going to encase their eggs for um, uh, several months. A lot of times these spiders will lay their eggs in the fall, uh, create their egg case, uh, and then they will, they will go off to the great beyond. Uh, there is some evidence that some species are able to uh, spend several years. They don't die after 
the first year that they go on from year to year. Burton Heinrich, the uh, the famous naturalist out east in New England, he has been watching barn spiders at his cabin in Maine uh, that he says are living you know, four and five years. But um, this was a, a pumpkin spider that I'd uh, been given a couple of years ago. And um, she was magnificent, had that beautiful uh, yeah, yellow-orange abdomen. She created this, uh, laid all these eggs. It was twice as big as her by the time she was done. There must be some expansion that goes on when they come out. But anyway, she um, d deposited those eggs, and then uh, the next day uh, she looked deflated like this, and then the day after that she was... She was no longer of this world, but uh, this is something that's going on right now. These are gorgeous spiders. Uh, even if you're not a fan of spiders, you got to admit they are pretty cool looking. Keep an eye out for them. They're a little bit, um, uh, you know, they tend to be locally common. Uh, I wouldn't say they're everywhere. I would, in a season, I might see one or two. Um, the, the cross orb weavers, though, you'll see those, um, those are, uh, Pretty prevalent and a wonderful opportunity to uh, get an up close look at these uh, these really cool orb weaving spiders. So Jerry also sent uh, I mean a reminder that um, uh, cup plants are they're uh, part of our local landscape. They're named uh, they're they're uh, they're uh, called uh, Silphium uh, uh, perfoliate, uh, perfoliatum. I believe is the species name. Um, it's because the stem actually, uh, the, the leaf grows on both sides of the stem. It looks like the stem is growing through the middle of the leaf or uh, perforating the leaf. Um, the way that structure comes together, it allows the plant leaves to form a cup where water can collect, insects can drink there. Every once in a while you might find a tree frog uh, tucked in there uh, absorbing some of that moisture. Well, um, Jerry actually uh, found some seeds of a cup plant a few years ago and uh, collected them and um, has uh, these uh, one, uh, gosh they've got to be what six seven feet tall maybe even more than that. Um, She's actually sending some cup seed plants this way. So um, the cup, cup plant seeds, let me try that again. Some cup plant seeds are coming this way. So if any of you would like some, let me know. Um, they are, sounds like they're pretty easy to grow. I know we have some, uh, some stands of cup plant uh, at Hickory Knolls at Otter Creek Bend. Uh, they're a, a, a Beautiful. They're, they're uh, one of uh, four silphium that grow in this area. They're related to the uh, prairie dock and the uh, the compass plant and the rosin weed. Those are all uh, silphium that grow in this area. But the cump plant uh, does really well. It, if you've got a low area or a damp area, they uh, especially like if, if they can have their feet wet. So um, keep that in mind. Let me know if you'd like some of those seeds. So uh, with that, um, we're going to break away here, and um, I want to introduce you to a little friend that I met today. Um, so I was over at Potawatomi. Um, full disclosure, I was looking for mushrooms. Didn't have a whole lot of luck. In fact, Potawatomi um, Scarecrow Fest is coming up this coming weekend, so there was a lot going on. They're, they're putting up tents. They're marking off spaces for the craft show. The, uh, the squirrels were all in a tizzy. The um, woodpeckers were uh, making a lot of noise. Um, so I uh, retreated back to the native plant garden where things are always a little bit quieter. And I was walking around just kind of looking um, at what might be uh, happening there in the garden. And I looked out into the water and I found, let's see, where did she go? I found, let me get I don't want our tech guy, <laughs> and I got in trouble a few weeks ago when I got sand in my keyboard. Uh, I don't want to get water on it. So I found this. I think, now I don't know, you know, how to tell if something's an authentic antique or um, if this is a, a reproduction, but uh, this caught my eye. It was in the water of um, uh, the, the shallows of the Fox River, and um, it was just, you know, kind of bobbing there. I think it's a head from a China doll. Um, there's uh, 
some holes there where it might have been sewn into the body. And um, what I was most excited about though, and you know what? She's retreated. Hold on. Um, I had to run back to my car and get this glass um, uh, to put some water in. Uh, there was a leech on the doll head. <laughs> and I wanted to show it to you. And she was all stretched out and ready to go at the start of the program. But she's gone inside. Oh, she's inside here. Let's see if I can get her out. Um, well, gee. No. Nope. Uh, anyway, you know me and the leeches. We've talked about leeches before. They are uh, really fascinating creatures. They are, uh, let me see if I can get her to come out. Um, she's inside the head. <laughs> um, they are, uh, killing. I can't, uh, I can feel her squiggling in there. I don't want to hurt her. Um, we may have to meet a leech another time. But uh, turtle leeches are, are pretty common in this area. We've also got some leeches that will attach to fish. Um, they are... Um, <laughs> Hold on. I've almost got her out. Well, you know what? She's adhered to the inside. All right, here she comes. Boy, I wish I had a smaller finger here to reach in and get her out with. I keep saying her. You know, uh, leeches are hermaphrodites. They're, they're, they have both male and female um, reproductive parts. Um, well, you know what? I'm going to stick her in the water here for a little bit. Maybe she'll come out. Um, I want to see if I can find a few more. I had I kept uh, some leeches for about a year. Um, what was it two years ago? With an eye on making a tempest prognosticator, which is a wonderful contraption that was um, conceived by uh, a surgeon in London in the 1850s. He saw how his um, Medical, uh, medicinal leeches behaved when storms were coming. They would uh, s slide up the sides of the tank that he kept them in. And he thought it was, um, they were reacting to the, the energy of the lightning in the air. It was probably the change in barometric pressure. But anyway, he um, he created this uh, gizmo. Um, it was, I think he had 12 vials that he would put water in. And uh, he put leeches in each of those 12 vials. Uh, when the, the uh, weather started to change, the leeches would, would slither up in the vials and they would bump their little leech heads against um, a lever that would then um, uh, push up and it would, uh, they were attached, those levers, levers were attached to chains that would then ring bells. So when the bells started to go off, uh, the good surgeon would know that uh, a storm was coming. He envisioned this as something he could install in all the ships of the Royal Navy and, and you know, save countless numbers of lives. Um, eh, people invented barometers uh, instead and went that direction, and the Tempest prognosticator never really took off. It's been a dream of mine to recreate that uh, with leeches that I find in the river. And I really thought this was going to be the first one I could introduce you to. It's going to have to wait to another time. Um, but she's not going anywhere. I'm going to set up, uh, get a little bit more permanent set up. Um, but for now, she'll just live inside the head in the jar here at Good Natured World Headquarters. Um, with that, it uh, looks like we got a few chats here to get to. Um, uh, Diane, you said that um, you have a friend in Wisconsin, uh, oh, with four young children who has several yellow jacket ground nests. Is there an environmentally friendly way to remove them? Um, so, the, the environmentally friendly way that I know of isn't always suitable. Um, th these ground nests, um, they're, they're tremendous sources of food for creatures like skunks. And uh, I know of at least two yellow jacket nests in the area that have been dug up by skunks. Um, and they do a pretty good job of eradicating them. But you can't call and schedule a skunk to come on a certain day and direct it to a certain nest. Um, I, 
we're very close and I don't know how far north in Wisconsin your friend is Diane um, these things are going to be dying down within the next month or so as the temperatures cool uh, what's what's going on right now and why they're so stingy is um, the the queen this year's queen is, is she's kind of slowing down she spent um, much of the season laying eggs and um, they've uh, the colony has raised next year's queens at this point those queens that will be starting next year's colonies are dispersing they're finding leaf litter they're finding fallen logs uh, wood piles things like that where they can overwinter um, and it's the these workers that are <laughs> kind of out of work they um, they're out uh, they're not feeding as many larvae as they were earlier in the season um, yellow jacket larvae too when when they are uh, are being fed they're also secreting um, a kind of a, a sugary substance well the um, uh, adult workers they're not getting that that sugary substance reward from the larvae anymore so they're out um, they're getting in our pop cans uh, in our beer bottles uh, they're also uh, taking little um, protein sometimes you'll get them on your hamburger if you're having a, a cookout um, I had one the other day on um, on my arm I was wearing short sleeves and it was pulling it was pinching pretty hard too I think it was pulling little uh, flakes of skin uh, or trying to pull little flakes of skin off me um, if your friend is is far enough north that it's gonna be getting cold soon if she could just wait a few more weeks that might help um, uh, otherwise um, she she's just above uh, Milwaukee just okay so pretty close by mm -hmm. um, you know the finish line is in sight if they've made it this far it's not too much farther to go but with young kids they're pretty unpredictable um, there are different pest control firms uh, that she could inquire as to their methods uh, sometimes it's um, more of a physical removal as opposed to a chemical removal if, if they could do that instead that okay. would be better okay thank you sure um, okay so um, Jerry said that the spider itself isn't by a light, but she's got a lot of company in the yard who are by lights. Gotcha. So um, yeah, that's. Um, uh, I think I've talked about that before. This the spiders. I'll I'll go you know, window shopping in downtown Geneva, but I'm not looking at what's in the windows. I'm looking what's on the windows because of all the spiders that build there by those lights. So. Um, Good to know, and thanks again, Jerry, for those great photos, as well as the uh, the cup plant seeds that'll be coming this way. Um, oh, and then Susie, yeah, so um, a few weeks ago, uh, we were out wading in the Fox River, and I found a little, what looks like a China doll foot that's uh, kind of broken, and uh, this, so this head was found, let's see, this would have been about two blocks north, you know, that's, it's, it's, uh, kind of sobering as this drought is that we're in there are so many interesting finds being made in the Fox River and the tributaries too because the the uh, water is so shallow all kinds of old uh, trash piles and things are are uh, coming uh, being un unveiled as the water uh, continues to recede yeah I wonder if the doll head because uh, I do have I, in fact I think it's um still in the uh, console in my car I should see if they go together if there's any kind of markings or anything on them uh, I'm gonna peek one more time the leech you know she's probably retreated all the way into the inside of that oh, I so wish I could show it to you but um, it's gonna have to wait for another time maybe we'll meet a leech uh, next week um, does anybody else have any questions or comments? Um, Laura, I know you've been out looking at a lot of cool fungus, um, and uh, we might do a, a, I'm sure we'll be doing a, a mushroom and, and fungi section uh, again very soon, because, um, boy, there's a lot of cool. Now that we've had some rain, maybe we'll start to see some of those uh, characteristic things that we see this time of year. Um, anybody else have anything they care to share? If not, really appreciate your time tonight. Um, be careful out there with all those chipmunks and squirrels. Um, and uh, hope to see you back again next week. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you, Pam. So long. Thank you, Pam. Take care.
Bye, guys. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Bye. Thank Thanks, Pam. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. You too, Sue. Bye-bye.